Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 15th episode of Taps and Patience, the podcast where Harrison tries to do the podcast before I hit record. Uh, my name is AJ, and as mentioned, this here is Harrison. Hi, Harrison. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing all right. All right. So what were you telling me just now? So for those of you who uh, are just catching up with us, um, I took off most of last week. I only worked about two days last week because my brother was graduating um, and from college. And so we went out to Tennessee to go visit him for his graduation. And then we, because it was in the middle of the week, we used the second half of the week to go ahead and do a little bit of a mini vacation. Um, and we went up to the Biltmore in North Carolina, which was really, really cool. Um, for those of you who like historical, um, mansions that you can tour, that's basically what this was. And it was, it was pretty freaking sweet. Um, and we might talk about it a little bit later, but while all that was going on, um, Etsy and work just started blowing up like crazy. Um, we did the most Etsy sales this last weekend when we were not th- here and we have everything <laughs> set to like one day ship. And so there's still a few orders um, that or not one day ship, um, like two or three day ship, but th- there's still a few orders that we haven't fulfilled. And this is the first in time that we've ever had so many orders that we couldn't get them fulfilled in one day. Um, even though basically everything was in stock, it just was that much lasering. And there was a few things that depleted our inventories of 3D printed parts that we had to. Uh, we can only print so fast and we've never had, yep. we, we had one person order um, like six 3d prints of like all the different colors that no one has ever ordered before, <laughs> like pink and yellow and um, purple. And it's like, we only have like one of those in stock and they like ordered multiples. And so yep. it was uh stressful, but in a good way. Um, and then we had, we had a company that's local that we went and whenever we had the mishap with the R Mar cut, um, I made four trips back and forth. Um, and in that time, I got to know some of the people at the shop and the shop manager um, just gave us a whole bunch of work. Um, oh, nice. So that's a, that's nice. And. So some of that work we have now and some of that work is work that we're going to have to do. He wants some custom stands for the shop. Um, So that'll be fun. And then another shop that we had done work with in the past sent us or tried to stop by while we were gone. So I got a phone call. He's like, hey, I'm here to drop off some stuff. And we're like, we're not there. Sorry. Come (laughs) back on Monday, Um, which I haven't seen him yet, but he's got some stuff. Um, What else? So, you know those coins, those like challenge coins and uh, poker coins? So, we got uh, an email from someone who wanted between a thousand to two thousand of those things. What? Yeah. Yeah, right there. There you go. Um, engraved or the blanks? They want them customized. It's for a casino. Really? Um, yeah. So. They want, um, yeah, like they were quoting a thousand to two thousand. They're not sure how many they're going to get, but um, a, a crazy amount for for what we have. That that so, is insane. Yeah. Um. So that was kind of really cool. Um, Can I say second laser? <laughs> maybe third at this point. <laughs> <laughs> that one job is gonna is is enough laser work to keep the laser busy for two or three weeks straight. I think. Wow. I think it was, it was over a hundred hours of laser engraving time um, for one laser. So that's a little over two weeks, Um, two and a half weeks of just straight lasering. Um, So um, if that in combination with the plate work, which we're trying to get, um, we, we might end up with three lasers at this rate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and the problem is, is that we have all this potential work, 
but none of it. We don't have a PO for anything, and so it's yes. kind of hard to to buy anything without having any of that stuff already like coming in. So, yeah. but um, when we went to pick up the plates um, from our stainless steel supplier for the for because we're doing a couple test plates for this guy, um, we sat down and talked to them for a little while, and I have been ordering stuff for them from years from my old job and I'd never been there in person. So I got to meet everyone that has quoted a bunch of stuff for me over the years. And then I started talking to him about my business and, um, showing him my Instagram page, some of the gun stuff, some of the laser engraving, some of the, uh, CNC machining and, and whatnot. And, um, a lot of them were like, well, we're probably gonna, you know, be buying some gun stuff. And, nice. you know, we have a couple of gun nuts here that, once they hear that you're going to do that kind of stuff, that they're probably going to be ba uh, banging down your door trying to get some custom stuff done. So it's kind of we're, we're getting to the point where stuff is starting to spread. We're starting to see. Um, and and it's it's a little frustrating because I don't know if it's the holiday season or if our business is actually taking off. And so it's yes. it's exciting. And, and I'm a little I'm, I'm hoping that it's like foreshadowing continuous progress and not just a burst and then it's going to fizzle out so well if nothing else you know that even if it is the holidays you'll know that this is how the next holidays will be yes yes for sure and and some of that work like the the thousand to two thousand uh coins and the uh name plates those are big enough orders on their own that like that'll be awesome for um for just work regardless of if it's repeat work or not it's just they're just really good jobs to get if we can get them so um and let's see here and there's there's a whole bunch of other stuff we've had other people that have just been coming by dropping stuff off uh gun wise um and so word is definitely starting to get out um right now at the shop we have We probably have 10 to 15 guns. Um, and so that people have dropped okay. off that they want work done to. Um, nice. So we're starting to to build up a backlog of stuff that we're, uh, you know, some of it's Cerakote stuff, some of it's RMR cuts, some of it's thread milling. Um, we have one guy who uh, came by and he wanted something done that we've never done before. And so that's kind of what I was working on right before um, the podcast was if you look at like bolt action rifles, the actual bolt that goes that you that you pull whenever you're loading in a, a new round and, and shove it forward to lock it down. Um, he had a Remington Remington 700 and the stock bolts whenever you go to reload it. If you have a sight on it, uh, a scope, excuse me, if you have a scope on it, when you go to flip up that handle um, with the stock one, it has the potential of pinching your fingers between it and the uh, the sight or the scope on top. Okay, I can um, see that. If it's, if it's a low sitting scope. And so all of these Remington 700s come with that little ball on the end of the, of the, handle that you flip up and there's a lot of companies that sell aftermarket pieces that you can uh bolt on to that spot but the problem is is that piece is cast and so yeah. what a lot of machine shops do is they have to come up with some unique fixturing to hold that thing vertical or to do it in a lathe and they machine off that ball and put a stud in that place and then people can thread on longer extension pieces to get your to to make that lever longer, and yep. to to where it doesn't pinch you whenever you're trying to reload, and we've never done that before, and we're about to do our first one, so that'll nice. be fun. Yep. So are you, so are, do you think your business is almost at the point where you can start to choose what you want to specialize in instead of trying to do everything? No. 
I do not. Um, and the reason is, is because at the current rate that it's going, as soon as one thing slows down, the next thing picks up. And if that's a trend that continues, then I can use things that peak at different times to keep a steady flow. That's fair. Um, so if around Christmas time, say all the gun stuff and the Etsy stuff skyrocks, but skyrockets, but all my job stuff, job shop stuff plummets because everyone's at the end of the year and they don't have any budgets left. Versus on the flip side, in August to about September or October, that's when the job shop stuff spikes because that's when everyone's trying to get everything spent um, before the end of year. Um, and usually install um, in this area happens between November and December. That's usually when everyone's installing all the work. So all the machining and all the all the assembly of stuff happens in the through, from August to September and October, somewhere in that range. And then shopping kind of picks up from November to December, whereas your job shop stuff falls off in that time period. That makes sense. So, um, and then I have no idea what the rest of the the rest of a busy year would look like. Like if we get to the point where um, right now we're, we're pricing our machine work stuff for guns very competitively, mm -hmm. but if we get busy enough, I'm okay with ratcheting that pricing up a little bit um, to okay. curb demand. Yeah. So, and that's kind of what we've been hoping for. Um, but I still, I still want to go after the job shop stuff and, and find stuff that's cause I want, I want to keep, all my machines running and there's not really anything that I do that keeps everything running simultaneously, except for maybe the laser at this point. Yeah. Laser mm -hmm. is, has probably the one machine that we're is running every day. Um, the most. So that has been, I, I, I did not see that when uh -huh. I first got it, but it's just insane. So what would it take? Like what what event would need to happen for you to go, okay, this is now what precision ingenuity does. This is what we're focusing on. Um right now, I don't feel like I have cash flow in the business. And I don't feel like I have a steady footing. Um so for the first year. Um, we haven't really taken much money out of the business. Pretty much everything we've been we've been doing has been going straight back into the business to help with growth. Um, and my goal, or our goal for as a company, is I want to get to that four thousand dollars a a week of revenue, roughly, um, and. If I can do that consistently, then whatever is helping me maintain that, I can start to back off other things at that point. Um, and so that's kind of my my mark is when I get to that point, um, then I can start specializing into whatever is fulfilling that $4,000 a week. Because there's two of us, so that'd be about $2,000 a week for both of us, which would be about $200,000 a year. Um, total revenue for the business. Yeah. So, which sounds like a lot more than it actually is. <laughs> yeah, that's not that's still just that's just surviving. Yes. Um, cuz um cuz I mean, if you think about it $4,000, you know, at at least at least 30% of that is usually uh spent in materials and uh, just fixed costs minimum. I would say um, probably closer to 50%. And then if we do start taking money out of the business, um, that extra $2,000, so let's say, let's say we make $4,000 a week. We'll just do a little number, number game real quick. Cause I like, I like numbers. Um, 2000 of those, of that dollars we can't touch of, because that's just making sure we can get cost stuff of doing done. business. Yeah. Cost of doing business. Okay. That other two thousand dollars would have to be split between us, so a thousand dollars a week. That sounds like a lot of money, and it, it, it is. It's not. It's it's a good amount of money, except for we can't take that thousand dollars a week each, because 
that's going to have to go back into some of that's going to have to go back into the business. Um, otherwise we're not going to grow and we're going to fail. Um, we have to constantly be investing in better processes, uh, and all sorts of stuff. I mean, that's all we've done. We've, we've made about a hundred grand in revenue this first year and we haven't seen a dime of it cause it's all just gets sucked up. Yeah. So, and that's not um, to mention once you do start paying yourself, you're paying taxes on that. Exactly. And, that was the next thing I was going to get and into insurance like, and yeah. mm-hmm. all of that stuff, both yeah. business insurance and personal health insurance. And yep. 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 And as, as of this point, you know, we're in a garage shop. We, we don't have, um, you know, our, our, our vehicles, we'd like to have insured by the business and owned by the business so that we can write that off as an expense. Um, we'd like to have medical insurance provided by the company so we don't have to pay it personally. Um, we'd like to, um, there's a lot of things we'd like to do, but the business needs to make enough money to where we can justify those expenses for the business to make our lives better. Yeah. Um, and all of that would eat away at any additional money at the top to the point where we're still taking home basically nothing at the, by the time it's all done. Yeah. And so. plus like once you have employees, uh, you're yeah. probably not going to be paying for their vehicle, but you will want to pay for their insurance because that's a, yep. a normal good perk. And yeah. And, and you know, I really want to make enough money that I could bring on an intern by the mm-hmm. end of next semester. You know, that's, that's a goal. I'd like to get busy enough because, you know, I, I listen to the John Saunders and the Grimsmos of this, of this world and you can't do everything yourself. And yes. if we're going to grow as a business, I can't be going out and talking to people and building those connections that I need to bring in business while still getting all the work done while still, um, you know, figuring out what we need to do as a company to grow. Like right now I, I wear all the hats in combination with my partner. Um, and we're still very inefficient because we can't focus very much on any one area for very long. Yes. And so I'd love to get an intern in to be like, I I want what I want to do. my, My, if, if I could plan everything out is I would love to get some work that is semi consistent to the point where I could hire an intern to come and do that work um, so that I could keep them busy and make money off of their labor so that I can focus on other things to bring in more work and kind of snowball that up. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, you don't hire an employee and lose money on them because no one would, no one would be hired by anyone. So, yes. So that's, that's the goal. So anyways, I've been talking for a while and I was gone for basically all of last <laughs> week. So <laughs> what's going on in your world? Boxes. So many boxes. I have been shipping the Kickstarter orders. Um, as of right now, I have 140 out in the mail. I have a additional 140 that I was hoping to get in the mail today. But I I kept running out of uh, inventory on things, and mm-hmm. so I wasn't able to get those done today. We were um, we worked on those all all weekend. My wife even came out and helped me um, oh, pack wow. boxes on Sunday. Um, it it just takes a long time to pack those boxes. There's a lot of pieces. I have so many different colors of things to go in there. It's just it's very tedious. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and so, you know, over the weekend, we just did a ton of packaging. We packaged probably 130 boxes yesterday. And then today I had like 10 packages left in this order. And the way I'm shipping them, I need to ship them all as a batch. If I print the labels as a batch, I need to ship them as a batch because the, um, you get what's called a scan form for the USPS, um, that basically means they don't have to go through and scan each box individually because they would have to scan 140 boxes and they, the, the postal workers would be very unhappy with you. 
So what you can do is you can print this thing called a scan form that just has one barcode on it. So instead of the employees having to scan every single box, they just scan this one barcode and everything's ready to go. So anyway, um, and that also helps avoid lost packages because it's easy for them to miss scan new one. So anyway, I didn't even I, know that existed. Honestly, it, 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 it comes up when you start doing bulk shipping. Um, huh. So it, and again, you don't have to do it, but it is a nice courtesy to the postal workers and you're less likely mm-hmm. to lose a package. Um, so I couldn't ship the other 130 because I had these last 10 packages left. But the last 10 that I saved are the people who ordered one of every carabiner um, and 12 key rings. That's, that's what all of these 10 orders are. And I did like two of them and then I ran out of a color. And so I powder coated more of those. And then I did like two more and then I ran out of color. And basically, I, I think I did like six batches of powder coating today, um, which is not what I was hoping to do. And I, I didn't even get those 10 boxes shipped because I spent so much time powder coating. I have my laser cut inserts to go in the box and I kept running out of those. And so I had to keep going and laser cutting those and. And basically, I just exhausted all of my supplies over the weekend. And then today, I just you know couldn't get that last mile done because I was so hung up with all these other things that I had to get caught up on. Um, so that was a little bit of a bummer. But I don't know. I'm, I, I think I have just about everything powder-coated today and laser-cut. So I should be good to get those out like first thing in the morning tomorrow. That's nice. But... So, but it's so, been a lot of shipping. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, you've been you've been busy, but that's that's nice that you're getting close to the end. I think yeah. I got my email saying that you shipped out my carabiner. So I, I did. I remember seeing yours. I remember seeing your name. Though actually, you're probably stuck in this batch that didn't go out today. So oh, okay, it'll go out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I saw I saw the email come through, and I think I think it was today or or maybe yesterday. Yeah, um, I, I like, think hey. it sent the emails for this batch today. Um. And I was planning on getting them out today, but it, it, they aren't going out yet. Well, that's, um, that's exciting. I'm, lo- I'm looking forward to seeing mine. After, so after I finished this batch, basically I've been doing things in order and complexity. And the first batch was just stonewashed carabiners. People who ordered stonewashed carabiners and just stonewashed carabiners. The second batch was people who ordered powder-coated carabiners and just powder-coated carabiners. Uh, the third batch is people who ordered either stonewashed or powder coated carabiners and key rings. Uh, so I've, which is the majority of the backers. Most people order just carabiners and key rings. Um, I think about 60% of people ordered a key ring. Um, so those are a pretty popular item. You also had pry bars, didn't you? Yes. So the next batch is probably going to be people who ordered lanyards and everything I've already shipped. And then after that, I will do people who have ordered pry bars and everything prior to that that's already shipped. I have most of the pry bars made, um, but I have one variant of the pry bars that has square corners instead of rounded corners on the request of one customer, which I'm kind of regretting now. Um, And I was working on those probably during the Kickstarter, and that was when I broke my carbide slitting saw. Um, uh, and so I just haven't gone back around to making those. So I'll, I don't know, probably two, no, tomorrow's Tuesday, probably Wednesday machine those, tumble them, send them on Thursday, I'm hoping. And that'll be the last of it. Okay. So. Interesting. Um, um it's taking me a lot longer to ship than I thought, but I'm pretty confident that I will beat the, uh, before Christmas deadline. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You just, yeah. The but oh. this this is the, this is the kind of experience though that'll make it just that much better. Whenever you have another one of these kickstarters, like every time you do something for the first time, I mean, you haven't shipped eight hundred of anything. Yes, <laughs> probably before, and so now that you've done that once, um. The next time you have a Kickstarter that that's this massive, you'll be a lot more prepared. I feel. Yes. Um, in terms of lessons learned, one, I, I did a bad job about like 
quality control in the course of the process and not just at the end. Um, I, I kind of got in the, the habit of batch work and that has killed me on a number of steps. Um, mm-hmm. Like the, the reason I was running out of carabiners is because I was finding um, and the, and the reason I had to do more powder coating is because I rejected way too many carabiners that I'd already powder coated. And basically what was happening is I would over powder coat them. I would put too much powder on and they wouldn't close right anymore. Uh, um, and I have like, I don't know, a couple dozen carabiners, three or four dozen carabiners that I found and rejected because of that. And I should have caught that earlier. Um, so I, I ordered a bunch of, um, chemical powder coat stripper. So I don't have to sandblast those at least. And I can just recode them. Um, so, I mean, it's not a huge loss. It's just wasted time and effort. Yeah. But so question on the carabiners that you annealed, do yes. you still have them? Yeah. Is there a way to re temper them to like heat them up and then quench them and re harden them or, or make them, um, to the point where they're more springy again? I don't know, but I don't think that's where I'm going to be spending my time. I have plenty of carabiners. I have probably 200 extra, 300 extra carabiners. Oh, okay. Um, so it's, it's not a huge loss. I just have to um, go, you know, remove the powder from the ones that I already powder coated and then recoat them. Though that actually I could even take stone washed ones and just powder coat stone washed ones. Um, mm-hmm. That would probably be a faster way of getting these orders shipped. And I probably should do that, but well, and I I wasn't necessarily meaning for trying to get stuff done right now. I was just meaning like in terms of at a later date, if you need to keep more in inventory and you know, the Kickstarter's done, but you have all these extra that you want to put on your website to sell. Can you save them that way? You're not wasting and scrapping them all. Um, I mean, that was only like, a dozen carabiners or 10 carabiners that I, I did that for, which is like 30 bucks of material. Okay. That's fair. So I, I, w- I would just buy more blanks and machine them if I really needed to. Okay. Fair enough. But I have plenty of inventory and I did finally get the, um, the carabiners on Etsy. I've actually had this listing since I think last week and Scott came over and, and brushed up my or polished up my Etsy store a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. And so this is the first time that I've ever had the re- like the a kickstarted item for sale in a reasonable time frame after the Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, do you have any sort of disclaimer or longer lead time? That way you can get all the Kickstarter stuff out first before pe- like if people start ordering it on Etsy right now, is, is it live on Etsy? It is live on Etsy. Um, I don't think I've gotten an order for them yet. But yeah, basically there's like a three day lead time on Etsy that I have listed. And I think I'm going to be done shipping of these before three days. Um, okay. It's not like I'm going to be so flooded in, in orders that it's going to delay the Kickstarter at all. So yeah. I'm not worried about it. But I wanted to make sure that when people started receiving their carabiners and sharing them on social media, that the people who saw that would then have a, an action that they can take. So instead yeah, of, yeah. oh, that's cool, they can go, oh, that's cool, I'm going to buy one. Yeah, yeah. So that's why that was important. You definitely, you definitely want to have it live. Um, the only thing I was, I just want to make sure that people who are ordering it on Kickstarter are not getting theirs after someone who ordered it on Etsy. No, that wouldn't that's, happen. Yeah, that's the only thing. Yeah, so that, that, I mean, technically, like there's technically no reason that you couldn't do that. It just doesn't feel ethical it doesn't feel honest to your kickstarter backers yeah yes um Mm -hmm. so yeah Yeah. i I always fulfill all the kickstarters before sending other things out yeah and i figured you did um it's just uh having some having gone through the etsy stuff right now especially (laughs) after our, our biggest rush when you see that ticker counting down um, you want to get it shipped out before or, or you'll be penalized. Whereas Kickstarter stuff, you don't have that a hard date that's ticking down. And so um, I just 
wanted to make sure you had enough time in there that if someone ordered it off of Etsy, you'd still get the Kickstarter stuff done first. So. Yeah. And I have sold a couple like of the pry bars from this Kickstarter before everything else was fulfilled. But is it because it's an add on item? I don't think it counts. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't I, think that counts. Um, I, I wouldn't be as worried about that. It's the main thing is the the not for climbing carabiners. Um, that's how I view that kind of stuff. Yeah, and we needed we did such a poor job on our Kickstarter campaign. If I was going to redo it, I would do so many things differently. I mean, it was um, your first one, so it, it was it was it was such a learning experience. And I'd love to do another Kickstarter campaign. Um, I need a oh, I just need to use all more. the extra time in your day. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have any right now. Um, but I'm I'm okay Same. with that right now. Um, we have a. We have a, uh, a a deficit in our cash flow right now, and all of the stuff that we're doing is this gun stuff and this Etsy stuff is stuff that doesn't take money out of our pockets because we have everything right now, and it's just straight cash flow in, which is going to help that deficit from some of the bigger orders that we're waiting to on various things. Some of them they've been, some of them we've got them done but they have a net 30 to pay him back. Yep. And so we can, we can see that cash coming, but it hasn't hit yet. Um, and so it's just the stuff that you deal with in business. Um, so the Etsy stuff and the gun stuff is nice because we get paid as soon as we're done. So, or in Etsy's case, you get paid before you even ship it out. So, um, stuff like that. That's the other reason I like that side of stuff. Like, you know, it, when I do job shop stuff, you know, it's, it's, very easy to see, you know, a, a multi thousand dollar job that we've done. The problem is, you know, you you have to get the work, you have to do the work, and then once you drop it off, then you have thirty days before you get paid, and that's if they pay on time. Which a lot of these guys, and it's it's not their fault completely. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know, I know. But a lot of these guys um, will send it to the wrong address. And because we have two addresses, we have our physical address and then we have a mailing address. And some people just don't see mailing, I guess. Uh -huh. I don't know. It's happened enough from enough different people that maybe there's something we need to do better on our end. And some stuff you can ship directly to us, which is part of the problem as well. Yeah. Because if you're shipping, uh, uh, FedEx or UPS, you can ship it to, or U, uh, yeah, UPS or FedEx, you can ship it directly to us. But if you're shipping USPS, um, it has to go to our mailing address because they don't deliver out into the country. Oh, really? At. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So like you can ship to our physical address. You just can't ship to our physical address. Yeah. In certain situations. And one of those situations is for a check. Um, so it's just it's once they get it down the first time they usually get it down but you know first time customers they uh, pretty much always ship it to the wrong address on the first go around. So can I complain about a bank for a second? Yes, Check. you can. We got a a letter in the mail from our bank that contained another letter that was inside of it. And that letter said that letter had a check in it and a note. And it was like, this check was sent to us. Um, we don't know why we have no relationship with this person. And so they, they sent the check back. So my bank sent these people a check instead of sending it to me. They sent it back to, to my bank. And then my bank sent that whole letter and packet back to me. And so at this point, this check is like 90 days late or something from when I was supposed to get this like $2,000 check. Oh, my. And I was like, okay, cool. I wasn't expecting this check. It was like overages from when we closed on this house or something like that. It was like a long time ago. So I was like, okay, yeah. cool. Free money. Deposited the check. Two weeks later, the check bounces. And USA, oh, no. our, our bank gives us a, a fee. It's like, you screwed up every single part of this. It is a check from you guys. How in the oh, world is no. this bounced? 
<laughs> and I mean, we we called them and we got them to um, reissue the check. And they're like, okay, it'll be there in in five to thirty five days or something like that. Just some ridiculous. And you're like, you're like, like, how how, it, how quick does it expire? <laughs> yeah, I, I know. <laughs> it'll be there five to thirty five days, but it expires in four. <laughs> It's like, what are you guys doing? Uh, oh, I should man. say, I I have USAA as my bank, and they are fantastic. I've almost never had problems with them. Like, this is basically probably the biggest problem I've had with USAA. Um, yeah, but it was, like, it was just, come on, guys, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll vent a little bit as well about snail mail. Uh, so we paid off my wife's car here recently, mm-hmm. and. When we got our title redone, it took two months for it to show up. I thought it was going to be like, I almost went back down to the DMV and was like, hey, where's my title? Yeah. <laughs> um, but thankfully, it showed up on, on literally the day I was planning on going down to do it. So I I had to do that for our um, new old truck. Um, the And it ended up being like the dealership that I bought it from didn't submit the paperwork and my temporary plates expired and so i had to go talk to them and talk to the bmv and get new temporary plates and you know it became one of those things that should have been two minutes but i ended up driving back and forth across town like four times yeah Yeah. even then i didn't have the truck for like a week because i didn't have plates that i could use Mm -hmm. let's see here what else we got um I think that's pretty much everything that I've had going on. In terms of What's... work I've actually done, I've just been shipping. Um, I have a request from a friend to design a product that they want to buy oh. from me. Um, nice. Which should be pretty quick and easy. I think it's something that I can use, just like materials that I can get from Alro or actually even Menards. and. Um, will probably be all or mostly laser cut parts. Sweet. Um, But basically, have you ever seen someone take a surface plate or a sheet of glass and stick sandpaper down to it? Um, Um, Yeah. To be able to like for like to to get everything perfectly flat. Yes. Um, And so uh, it's the can I? Yeah, there's no reason not to say the name. It's the guys from Servent Solutions. and basically they do like a lot of tabbing things off because they're basically a prototyping shop. Um, and so they clean up the backside on a, you know, with a piece of sandpaper. And apparently they like to keep different plates of sandpaper for all their different materials. So there's no cross contamination, I assume, mm-hmm. finish. I don't really know why they do it. I would just use the same sandpaper. Um, so they were asking if I could laser cut them something. And it was like, I, can do you something better than a piece of laser cut wood. So I'm probably going to find some sheets of glass that they can laminate their, um, their paper onto and Mm -hmm. then make some sort of base plate, which again, will probably be laser cut um, acrylic, maybe something that won't uh, be affected by water if they wet sand. And you can just clamp gotcha. that base plate down to a table or put some rubber feet on it. And then you can swap out the plates that go in it. And that'll probably be a, a, a product. Maybe not a main product, but it's something that I use frequently. So I figure other people will also use it. Um, is the sandpaper going to be glued to the glass or is it going to be just wrapped around it? I believe like, is it they... replaceable. So I don't know what they do normally in their workflow. Um, I use a sandpaper that already has a adhesive backing from Klingspore um, that I really like. And I'll probably send them some pieces of that and they may use that going forwards. I don't know what they do right now. I know some okay. people use like Super 77 to glue it down. Um, but you can peel it off pretty easily afterwards and, and replace it or. With the the stuff that I use, you take a heat gun to it and you basically just heat gun and pull and it pops off. Okay. Well, that's Clean not it with too a bad. little acetone stick on a new sheet. Yeah, gluing stuff down is it, it's a superior method of holding it. I just for replaceability's sake, I was I was hoping that it was easy to get off. Um yeah, if 
using the <coughs> excuse me, using the spray adhesive um, works fine, and it's probably the cheapest and easiest way of doing it. But you run into flatness issues where if you end up with a blob of adhesive in one spot, it'll make your sandpaper less flat, which will make your sanding less flat. The yeah. cling spore, um, <coughs> the cling spore adhesive back stuff is dead, dead, dead flat um, and dead consistent. And it works really well. Um, I like their silicon carbide stuff, the black sandpaper. Because it it breaks down faster, but it's sharper when it's new, and just leaves really nice finishes and cuts really fast. Oh, that's um, awesome! But yeah, it, you have to replace it more. Yeah, finishing processes is something that not a lot of people talk about in machining. But I feel like as a someone who's doing a mix of product and job shop stuff, I'm doing more and more of it. It's like ninety percent of the design, the everything business at this point is is finishing. And like I said, I've been powder coating all day. Um, yeah, it's. Do you guys have a tumbler yet, or any plans to get one? We don't have one yet. We've talked about it. It's on our list of two buys. Mm-hmm. It's just it hasn't made it very high up the list yet because we don't have anything that we would use it consistently on. Yeah. That being said, um, that being said, did you tumble? Did when we got you when we gave you those coins? Did you tumble them? No, I did not. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. I take that back. I did. Um, I sandblasted them and then tumbled them. Though I didn't. They didn't have long enough in the tumbler, so they weren't. They were still a little bit sharp. But okay, I did. Because one thing that. I would like to do is whenever we're making them, they're such a finicky material that because they're 304 stainless steel cutoffs. If it was our choice, they'd be 303. But when they're cutoffs and free material, you don't complain. You just use mm, yeah. um, in the very center. So if you look at them and I don't, I don't know if yours did it. We have good and we have bad. I think we gave you all the, all the better ones. Um, Cause we try to give the nicer ones out if people want them. Um, and we try to save the bad ones for ourselves to use for deep engrave. So when we do a deep engrave, because it ends up basically cleaning off the surface anyways, it, the surface finish doesn't matter. But anytime you're doing a black mark, um, those need to be basically perfect. Yeah. Um, so if you if you look at those coins, whenever it's cutting them, at when they get down to about a three quarter of an inch to a half inch in the center, you reach the max spindle speed of the lathe. And so your surface footage starts to quote unquote decrease as you get closer and closer to the center. And you can see that on the face of them. Um, And I would like to find a way to clean that up and make them look uniform all the way around, especially if we're going to be doing a thousand of them for a casino. And, um, but if we're doing them for the casino, we're going to probably buy fresh material. So we're going to buy 303, yeah. um, which will help a lot because we can go faster and it, it should give us a better finish. Um, but I would like to figure out, you know, tumbling wise or, or some other process that we could do to clean them and have them be uniform. Um, so. there was yeah, something. It, oh, yeah. Sorry, I was thinking about on. this casino thing. One thing that uh, I w- I forgot to mention. Do you know how much a thousand to two thousand of these coins would weigh? Just out of curiosity, Ooh. they're not light. They're bulky. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going with two hundred and sixty nine pounds. Nice, but no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was between. Uh, I think it was around one hundred and fifty pounds for. Okay. Uh, uh, about a a thousand twelve hundred of them Uh, so are you thinking about shipping is that the yeah yeah i mean how do you ship like you ship it all you have to ship it in multiple batches because i think 50 pounds is the max you can do unless you have to put it on a pallet so i have a really good answer for this okay large flat rate boxes they go up to i believe about it's either 60 or 75 pounds and they're like like 18 bucks, no matter how much weight you put in there. It is by far the cheapest way to ship heavy things. If 18, they fit. 
18 bucks? Are you serious? Yeah. It they're it, it's not expensive if you're shipping 75 pounds. But most people ship like, you know, 12 pounds or like 2 pounds. So it uh doesn't bite them here my screen share mode. Um large flat rate box, you get the boxes for free. 12 by 12 by 6. How much does it cost? USPS. You probably have to have a, do- a destination, maybe. I don't know. Flat rate. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess it is flat rate. So, um, nineteen ninety five. Oh, we were. Wait, wait a minute. Seventy pounds. So for oh, we would. Oh my goodness, that's going to be so freaking heavy. They're going to hate us. Yes, <laughs> I, and I, I. And I feel like we could we could reach that really easily. Um, with that, because stainless steel, like you grab a foot of it and it's like, oh, this is, you know, not too bad. You grab a six foot stick of it and you're like, I'm about to throw out my back picking up this, you know, yes. over <laughs> inch and a half thick round bar, solid stainless steel. Um, but and you can make you- 70 pounds, 20 bucks. It's their rules, not yours. Maybe oh bring it goodness. to the post office so that the uh, mail person doesn't have to stick it in their truck. But like, yeah, I I know yeah. people who ship stock like that. Like they'll cut up oh stock goodness. like that. It's the cheapest way. It is. The next thing that I need to figure out is how if I need to buy like a sleeve or 3D print a sleeve mm. to stick them in to protect them. If we get it. You let's see. You could do like laser cut cardboard things, like I do, and do like um one that has a like array of holes, and then do mm-hmm. a solid piece of cardboard, and then another one that has a array of holes, and the coins go in at the solid piece of cardboard. Yeah, that's not a that bad that would idea. be professional and cheap. Um, you could cut foam. Yeah, you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want a saran wrap or bubble wrap every single one. No, or no. individually bag uh-uh. them. Mm-mm. We um, individually bag everything right now because it's all <laughs> small stuff. But it, yeah, thousand to two thousand. No, you could buy like end mill containers. Yeah, that could work. Like a larger diameter. Yeah, you could just you could just fill buy them full. those. I need to look. Who, who, does uh, <laughs> Uline sell anything like that? Oh, I'm sure Uline sells something like that. So, line. I don't know what to call them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, end mill containers. Um, I don't know. Oh, hang on. Shipping tubes. Um, uh, shipping. Yeah, mm, maybe. Actually, shipping tubes. Yeah. Long poly mailers. I didn't know those existed. Clear huh. retail tubes. Those might be nice looking. Telescopic yeah. craft tubes, adjustable tubes. They have all sorts. They have all sorts of stuff. It's U line, but yeah, so, yeah, something like that. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to find something. They're they're thirty nine millimeters. So if I had like a, if they had like a forty millimeter, that'd be like perfect. Yeah. So I bet they have something. Forty millimeters yeah. is uh, let's see, inch and a half, roughly. Uh, yeah inch to millimeters is oh 30 inch and a half is 38 millimeters yeah Here, yeah there, there are 39 millimeters technically so but it'll it'll be a challenge a fun challenge um and the nice thing is that the lead time for them is really long so it's not like we have to get them done right away um uh-huh. i think we quoted like a seven week lead time for like the 2000 order. Um, and that's just, and, and, but their due date is like in, I think April, if we get it. Oh, so yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It, it's, it's, it's far enough out that we, if we did only get a second laser, we'd be fine. Mm-hmm. Cause we could, we could between two lasers, if we got the plate work and this work, um, we could fit the coins in and, and there'd be no excuse for the laser not to be running. Yep. 
but we could fit everything in and, and let it go. And I'd probably 3D print a grid that I could stick these coins in so I could do like 20 or 30 at a time or however many I could fit in there. Yeah. And have them positioned accurately. Mm hmm. Yeah. Which here's another thing that I've been thinking about that would be a fun challenge. Um, and I think I have an idea in my head. But one thing that we do is when we flip the coins, you want to flip them 180 degrees perfectly mm, so that they kind of yeah. line up to each other. We've just been manually doing that. I would like to have a jig that is like a box with a circle cut out in it that you can hold them with. And I thought I could do either like a light press fit or I thought doing them as a two piece design where they have because the 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 discs ha or the, the little discs, they have a, a radius corner. Yep. And so if I size the two halves correctly, I could have it grab that lip and hold them together and then have like a another groove on the outside of the box to hold a rubber band so they can split apart so you can mm -hmm. insert them in there and then it'll clamp down on it. And then I can stick them in a grid and then I can, it's real easy to flip them 180 and then you just pop them out when you're done. Yeah. You could, you could just print a gridfinity base plate and then make a gridfinity bin that holds the coins. There in you it. go. <laughs> yeah. But that way we could do a bunch of them at a time and then it'd be real easy to flip them from one side to the other. Yeah, that makes sense. That's something you're going to want to have in a more reliable process. Yeah. If you're yeah, making 2,000 of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be awesome and crazy. Yep. <laughs> so the machining time won't be that bad. Um, I think we can we can do op one, op two, around three to Those four minutes per two coin. Ops. Yeah, they're only two ops. Why are they not one op? Uh, because when you go to part them off, it leaves a nub. Ah, the nub. There's always a nub. Yeah, and the part off tools finish is absolutely horrendous hmm. compared to the finishing tool. Okay. We tried. We tried a bunch because <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, really want them to be a one op part. If they were a if, if we had a dual, if we had a, a, a sub spindle instead of a tail stock, we could do it all in one op, basically, because yeah. then that part could be held while the part off was being done. And then you don't have a nub and we yeah. could probably get better finish with it if we had a, something that could support it, that way we, we could slow it down and adjust feed rates. We could probably get it pretty good at that point. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't have that. So yeah. we're going to have for a thousand to 2000 parts we're going to have, and this is where I really wanted to intern or something. <laughs> we're going to have, we're going to be <laughs> sitting robot. in front of the machine loading one. Cause we, we can load a bar up and get all of our op ones done. You know, we could load up like a three to four foot bar and let it run for a couple hours on its own. Cause we got that bar puller. So it'll, it'll just pull it, advance it forward, cut one, advance forward, cut one, advance forward, cut one. That's super easy. Up two, it's going to be a lot of just sitting in front of the machine, loading a part, and letting it run for 30 seconds. Because the up two side's a lot quicker. Because mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have that part off is pretty slow. Yeah. Um, but. Just because it's well, and and everything we've been doing so far has been in three hundred four. I ha I haven't adjusted the speeds to see how fast we can go in three hundred three hundred three. You can almost go twice as fast as three hundred four. Okay. Wow, yeah, and end up with and end up with a better surface finish. Um, it's kind of insane the difference between three hundred three and three hundred four. <laughs> like, I got so used to three hundred three machining that whenever I throw these in, I'm just like, why is it taking so long? Um, but if you go any faster, you chip tools or your finish goes to crap. Yep. Um, so, but, anyways, it's it'll be it'll be fun. Um, I'm, I'm. It's another one of those jobs that I, I really hope we get. Yeah, that that'll be a good job, especially with such long lead times. That means it's one you can just use to fill downtime. Exactly, exactly. And we have another one that I've talked about. Did I tell you about the? Uh, I know I've talked about it some, but I don't know if I've told you about the the latest results. We where we did some uh, sheet metal that we were forming. Yeah, uh, I haven't heard the latest results, but so last I heard you're making parts that were too perfect. Yes, we have fixed that. 
We okay. have <laughs> we have taken a hammer to the fixture to the to the dies figuratively <laughs> and machine them to be imperfect dies so we can make replica parts. <laughs> yeah, mm. it it sounds and feels so wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But that's, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And I'm pretty happy with how they turned out. I got to weld them up now to see how well they look fully welded out. Mm -hmm. um, but once that's done, um, I could get an order for a couple hundred of those. Which would be yes. awesome. Yep. Um, but it'll have a whole new challenge of heat treating. Ah. They, they do get heat treated not really heat treating, but they get blued, like heat blued. Oh, okay. And so, I don't know if that's, it might be harder. Yeah, because I, I want to, I don't want to sit there with a torch if I'm doing, you know, a couple hundred of these, trying to get them all to look the same. I'd mm -hmm. much rather, st although if I stick them in an oven and I get the process down so well, it might be problems. Maybe they do want the heated torch process. <laughs> Maybe you need like a forge. Well, that <laughs> or if I could have a, uh, maybe I could have something where I just have like a, like your robotic pusher that you were using on your carabiner, yes. <laughs> except I have something that like, it'll extend out and hold the parts over the fire and then pull it back, extend out, pull back, extend out, pull back mm -hmm. and kind of slowly do that and and then I could load up a couple parts and just have them kind of alternate in and out of the flame. And then I can just take them on and off. I How I think about that. Would you just do it with heat? You wouldn't use like WD-40 or anything like that? That That's how they were claimed to have been done is just heat blued. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to. I've done it with um, WD-40 before and it gives you a nicer blue. Explain that. Uh, you get the part hot, you take the part out of the fire, you spray it with WD-40, it get blue. Okay. You just spray it? Yeah. Huh. Actually, I, 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 mean, I'm, I remember I did parts both ways, and, I don't rem and one of them was more blue and one of them was more black. And I don't remember if the WD-40 was more black or if it was the one that was more bluer. This one's more black. Whatever the ones, whatever method was done. I imagine these were heated and then dunked in something, if I had to guess. Yeah, oil is, well, yeah, that's what you're basically doing with the WD-40 is you're just, it's like dunking Surface it in oil. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it, it's more a question of just how do you get it hot quickly? Yeah. Um, you could... You could do uh, induction heating. That's always cool. I would. I would. I really want to play with an induction heater at some point. Um, that's and you can start doing idea. heat shrink tooling too. Yeah, if I build my own or buy something that I can use for both processes, that I would really like to play with some heat shrink tubing or tooling, not tubing, um, tooling. Sir, talk to Servent Solutions. They made a. DIY heat shrink uh, heat shrinker. I don't know what the term is. A heat shrink <laughs> station that yeah. basically used 3D printed parts and some like commercially available induction heating stuff and looks really nice and seems to work really well. And who was that? It was Serven uh, Solutions. Serven Same guys I'm making the sandpaper thing used for. Gotcha. You have to write that down. Um, yeah, because I, I I think he was sharing the files. I think he was offered to sell them at some point. I don't know how many orders he got for them. But I think their system... I mean, it was like a couple hundred bucks to throw together. Gotcha. Nice. I'll have to look into that. I have a question. Okay. I have this tool holder. This came okay. with a batch of, of used ER16 tool holders that I got that ended up being super nice, except for mm -hmm. this one. And for mm -hmm. the life of me, I cannot get the pull stud out of it. I've tried It looks heat. like someone took, took, took a grinder to it. Oh, that was me. I've tried heat. I've tried cold. I've tried uh, making bigger flats on there. And I have accomplished zero budget of the pull stud. Do you have any idea on what else I can try? 
My last thing is to take an angle grinder, cut it off as best I can, and then drill it out. That is my last possible thing that I can think of. If you had a slitting saw still. I do. I have them now. You have them now? Yeah. Could you stand it vertically? Um, and my <laughs> guess is that there's a lot of tension between the bottom of it and um, the, 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 like the, the screw itself isn't really holding. It's only holding because there's tension between the pull stud and the body of the, of the tool. Could you hold it vertically, use the slitting saw to go around until you've r- removed that tension? Like like cutting at the interface where they meet, and you could maybe slowly walk it down to where you're not actually hitting your pull stud, but mm-hmm. or where you're hitting your tool. Could you cut a relief <coughs> ring around it, like a snap ring groove? Hmm. It would take all of the tension out of that, but still leave you enough meat to grab onto to to spin it off without losing anything. Potentially, though, at that point, I should I could just interpolate it out. <laughs> yeah. But- but I, I was just trying to think of a way where you wouldn't have to try to machine out the screws or like where yeah. it still left you something to grab onto. Cause you could obviously just machine everything away. Uh, but then you'd have to get like an easy out or, so, or something else to try to grab it with this. You can potentially remove all your tension and still twist it out. Still yeah, have something to grab fair. onto. That might be worth trying. I don't know. I've just had this thing forever. It's a nice tool holder. It's a Technics tool holder. Um, have you hurt? Have you hurt the taper at all? I haven't. Um, I could okay. have potentially um, annealed it a little bit, but I mean, it just went straw. Like it didn't get too hot. Yeah. Um. So I don't think so. I think it's fine or as good as it okay. was when I got it used. And they seem to be in pretty good shape. Um. Do you have the socket that goes on the end of those? No. Okay. Do you know that they sell a socket for those? I I did. I've obviously not used one, but they're really yeah. Um, because you can stick those in the in the tool holder that Tormach you can buy from Tormach, and mm-hmm. then you can if you have that bolted down, they have a socket that you can stick on the end of those that has the profile of the pull stud. That's how we did put all of ours on and off, and we used a, a torque wrench and torqued them down to like twenty or thirty foot pounds, something like that. Yeah. Um, which are well, you just trying to grab those with a pair of pliers? I mean, I've tried wrenches, I've tried pliers, I've tried vice grips, I've I've done everything at this point. Okay, except for the actual socket that's designed for it. Except for the actual tool, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just to be clear, um, because if they torqued it on, that's probably. I mean, if they just over torqued it. Um, and oh, they boy, use the right they. tool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, then that's that's just where all your your fighting's coming from. And so that that would be my two solutions: either get the right socket for it, which I, they're pretty cheap. Um, I think Tormach even has them on their website. Oh, if it's the same style. Um, well, uh, well, okay. So one, the problem is no, it was just slightly different than the Tormach pull studs, which is why I had is to it replace still, them. Is it still it's close? Okay. It's like okay. a little bit longer or something. I don't know. Okay. Um, th- also, the other advantage- also, I've I've ground away anything that socket could grab onto. That's probably true. Um, hmm. Yeah, at this point, you, you just throw it in your machine and use the slitting saw. <laughs> That'd be a fun project, anyway. Yeah. It'd be it'd be a fun, fun so challenge. I'm terrified of ruining my nice new slitting saw. That I need for these um, pry bars. <laughs> I, I would do it afterwards, after yes. your pry bars. <laughs> so I'd put that on the side. When you when you have a when you have one of them that you're you're slitting saws, you're looking at, and you're going, mm, I don't know how much life that one's got. That's when you do this. I I actually have that one that I uh, broke a couple teeth on. I guess I wouldn't mind sacrificing that guy. Yeah, just just go really slow and just work it in. <laughs> so I. I am much more optimistic about this round of slitting sawing than the last round of slitting sawing because before, or I got new slitting saws that are both smaller diameter and thinner. And I got two different ones. I think one's a little bit bigger than the other one. Um, 
but that means that I can run them at a higher RPM to get the same SFM, which will um, mean that I'm not in the window of RPMs where the Tormach doesn't have any torque at all. So okay. that'll help. And then also because they're thinner, that means they'll demand less torque from the machine in the first place. Yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping that'll go a lot better. Yeah. That'd be good. You have to I let me know need, how that turns out. Yeah. I just need to actually get around to that. Um, <laughs> Has your machine been running much since you, you, you finished all your carabiners, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. I finished those a long time ago. Um, yeah. Have no, you been using your machine since then? Not much. Um, I've been working on, I've been very, very, very slowly in the background <laughs> machining those, um, um, generatively designed challenge coins. Mm -hmm. Um, at this rate, I'm averaging like one op every probably two or three days. Um, considering that the operation takes about 15 minutes is kind of sad, but it's basically mm -hmm. just whenever I think about it, <laughs> I'll flip it over and run the other side of one or whatever. Or stick a new one. Those, in. those are really cool. I really like how those turned out. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm fairly happy with them. The tool path on it isn't super fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, yeah, they're working. Yeah. I, I, if, when you're done with those, I might have to talk to you about stealing that design and selling them. If you're not That's going fine. to, I'll give you my, um, um, my fusion API script. Yeah. Oh, that actually doesn't help you that much. No, because it's, uh, not laser. Well, no, I would machine them probably. Oh, okay. Um, then yeah, you're, easy. you're, you're machining through the radius, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. See the laser. The only problem with the laser is as it went around that radius uh, one, if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to machine around that, if I'm trying to laser around that radius, um, no matter how well I fixture them, if I'm going to have it fully, fully laser through that, I have to go past it. So whatever is around it is going to get damaged. So the laser, you don't like to overlap stuff because you can damage things that are around it. Yes. And <laughs> like the laser itself. Um, yeah. The base of the laser. Um, as well as the um, mill. Um, whenever you're milling it versus lasering it on that radius, the laser would actually the laser removes removes a layer of material regardless of the shape of the material. Mm hmm which can be really nice when you're doing gun slides because you want all of it to drop down at the same level. But when you're doing that pattern that you did, I would want it to go flat into it. I wouldn't want it to wrap around that radius. Um, Cause I think that looks better. To be fair. If I had been able to get the API to do it, I would have inset a circle like, I don't know, 50 thou, a hundred thou from the edge. Mm -hmm. um, I would have just done a, a circle that's um, concentric with the outside of the shape, mm -hmm. the outside of the cylinder. And then I would have just had my design trimmed to that circle. Mm -hmm. But I was never, never able to figure that out. Yeah, but I think the way you have it where it's going past that radius makes it more tactile in the corners when you're holding that's it. That's true. Um, and that's what, that's what I really like about it is because it, it's... It's a cool design, but it goes around the corners in such a way that it makes for a more interesting coin to hold. I haven't actually held or held any of these coins that you've done yet, but just looking at them, I can tell just by the by what I what I feel like they would feel like that it's just an interesting. It, it breaks. It's it's instead of having um, knurling around the corners, it kind of gives something for the corners to grab onto. If you're I was about to say it. that it almost feels like really, really, really aggressive knurling or really, really, really large knurling. That's yeah. what it feels like. Yeah. So I think that would just be a, a really cool um, mix for it. So anyway, I probably need to go finish getting these carabiners packed. Do you want to take us out? <laughs> yeah. Um, everyone who's uh, been hanging on to us talked this evening uh thank you for hanging out with us and hopefully you you learned something or uh maybe got an idea for something you're working on please uh subscribe and tell all your friends about us and we'll see you all next week bye